Let us worship God. Come, all you who carry heavy burdens, and Christ will give you rest. For he is gentle and humble in heart. In him we find rest for our souls. The Lord be with you. O oh God, you are infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, glorious in holiness, full of love and compassion, abundant in grace and truth. Your works everywhere praise you, and your glory is revealed in Jesus Christ our Savior. Therefore, we praise you, blessed and holy Trinity, one God, forever and ever. Amen. God upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. Therefore, let us confess our sin with every confidence that we will be lifted up. Merciful God, we fill our lives with comfort and convenience, distractions that consume our energy and time. We chase after wealth and power, 
as if they could satisfy the hunger in our souls. But you beckon us toward new life, a life made rich through Sabbath and service. Free from us the yokes that bind us and draw us near to you until we learn to walk with Christ. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting unto everlasting. Hear the good news. Hope does not disappoint. For God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us in baptism. Believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Since God in Christ has forgiven us, let us also forgive one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ. can gather to worship even though we are at a distance and we pray that as we come together today you would be blessed in this time of worship together i would lift up a couple of announcements first a reminder that we will be celebrating communion uh, during this service and if you've not yet had a chance to gather what you need for communion in your homes i'd invite you to spend a minute or two going ahead and doing that so that when we come to table together you be prepared also, just to lift up a couple of education opportunities that are going on, we continue with the third of four of our race equity challenge gatherings uh, today and then this week, Thursday. Some of you had been out of town and weren't able to participate in these and know that if you would like to, we'll be starting a second round of these uh, mid-month. And so please just let the office know so we can get you on a list and uh, prepare to do that. Also, a reminder that our Faith and Film uh, series will be dealing with uh, In Living Color uh, and are dealing with issues around race, showing films about that. This week's film will be Selma. And if you'd like to participate in watching and having conversation about that, again, let the office know and my assistant Chris can send you the Zoom link to make that happen. We have a minute for mission today. And so we'd invite you to listen closely to that. Nashville welcomes people from all over the world who have had to flee wars, trauma, religious persecution, and deprivation. 
Helping refugees navigate the complicated path to U.S. citizenship is at the heart of Nations Ministry. Nations Ministry is affiliated with the Presbyterian Church USA and provides needed help in application preparation, language, civics classes, coaching for job interviews, and other support. Nations Ministry works hand in hand with our own Joy in Learning Ministry, providing a welcoming and supportive atmosphere for elders from Nepal. But in recent days, many of the ministry's clients have had to navigate the challenges of the pandemic coupled with job loss. So it is that we have another hands-on mission opportunity for you. We're inviting you to join in Nations Ministry Food Relief Bundle Drive. Pick up a gallon of milk, a box of cereal, eggs, juice, chicken, a bag of fruit, soap, and household cleaners. Keep an eye out for details on how you can select a day and a time to sign up. Nations Ministry is helping rebuild lives. Your generosity makes it happen. The Lord be with you. Gracious God, in Jesus Christ, you have been our hope in ages past, and you are our hope for years to come. Be our hope this day, we pray, as the scriptures are read and your gospel proclaimed, that we might be filled with the unspeakable hope that is ours in Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our first reading comes from Matthew's Gospel, the 11th chapter, beginning at verse 16. Hear the word of God. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by their deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise, and the intelligent, and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Turning to our psalm, I invite us to read that responsively. Psalm 145, 8 through 12. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and God's compassion is over all that God has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power known to all people, your mighty deeds, and glorious splendor of your kingdom. We read from the seventh chapter of Romans, verses 15 through 25a. Hear the word of God. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But it, in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be the law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Why did I say that? Why did I do that? What on earth possessed me to believe that? I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. I don't know how much of your life is a temptation to do the wrong thing. I have seen an individual waiting in his car two and a half hours before the AA meeting was to begin. He's just leaning into doing the right thing. He's in a fight for it, not to do the very thing that he hates. For some, coming to worship is like that, a weekly meeting. Worship is like going to the Y, needing to exorcise out the demons while exercising the better angels of our nature. I'm a better, healthier person when I go to worship. You have to be strong to maintain your composure in this world. You have to be disciplined not to lose it with your neighbor. You have to build up your body so that you can tolerate the coworker who is like fingernails on a chalkboard. I need to come to worship to fill up my tank, to make it through another week. The trouble is, I don't know about you, I don't make it very far. I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Christian walk is so hard, if we have to do it on our own, we don't have to do it on our own, do we? Paul says, no, well, there, you, got, you got some strength, you got fruit, says Paul in Galatians. Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, yes. But when it comes to fruit, my wife is always giving them away. 
I love this time of year. I love the summer. I love it when the strawberries ripen. I have bought, bought carton after carton of strawberries this year. So good, I hope you've had some. I've bought crates and crates and crates. I think five crates of peaches. Nothing like a fresh peach. I know five crates seems like a lot. Seems like a lot to me. I would have thought four crates would be enough. But on Friday, I was riding back to my home, back to the church, came into the na- back from the church, came into our neighborhood, and a neighbor yells out, Thank you for the peaches. And I turned my bike around and I said, Has my wife been giving away my peaches? Yes, came the response. She's the nice one in your house. When I purchase peaches, I don't think about giving them away. I think about peach pie. I think about peach cobbler. I think about breakfast with granola and yogurt and coffee and blueberries and a fresh peach. I think about me. My wife looks at fruit and thinks about others. Joy, kindness, love. She's giving away my peaches. I'm wondering if Paul wrote, I do not do what I want, but do the very thing that I hate because his spouse kept giving away his fruit. I don't understand it. We all have our sins that keep tripping us up over and over and over again. Is it just a lack of willpower? Is it a lack of a personal discipline that says, just look around, there's plenty of fruit to go around, there's plenty of fruit? None of that works for me. How about you? On closer inspection, Paul isn't saying that we need more willpower. Paul isn't some life coach that is here to help us develop a muscle that helps us get through those moments, more discipline, those moments that we will regret if we fall victim to them. Paul is talking about something that is much bigger than the self much larger than the human condition. He's talking about sin, he's talking about evil, he's talking about a cosmic power that is so pervasive that it can take what is good and turn it into bad. Like flowers that fester. Like a peach past its prime. Moldy, rotten, wasted. Paul uses the law as an example. God gives us the law, the beautiful law, the bright and shining law, the glorious law, good law. But what happens is, is that we can begin to worship the good law instead of worshiping the good God. And Paul knows it from his own experience. He was so so zealous for the law. He was so righteous about the law that it placed him on the street one day. And with one hand, he held up his iPhone. And with the other hand, he held the clothes of those who were stoning Stephen. Killing a man who had, they say, a face like an angel. But Paul was protecting the law. He loved it so much. Good gone bad. We see it all the time. The internet It was supposed to be the information superhighway, the world at your fingertips. But what in the world? 
Not a super highway, more of a traffic jam. People losing their cool, filled with hatred and pornography and lies and anger and threat and conspiracy theories designed to set us off on one another. It was supposed to be good. Good gone bad. Or you can take, well, you can take just about any word. I think of the word independence. I think of that word because of this weekend we celebrate our independence, or as the British press called it, a mob of insurrectionists who stormed a ship, destroyed property, dumping tea into the sea. The British press called it a riot, anarchy, as mobs tore down the statue of King George III in New York City. I never much cared for the British press. I prefer to read independence as I have always read it, a celebration over tyranny. There is nothing as wonderful as a fireworks display, in which the pyrotechnics, of course, were all manufactured in the USA. I mean, there is nothing as beautiful as independence, the celebration, the orchestra playing, the crowd cheering. Do you remember the good old days when we could come together and celebrate independence? But now we are living in these days when we have a war on independence because some have independently chosen to kneel at a national anthem, because some have independently chosen not to wear a mask, we are fighting for independence in this country. It's going to get bloody in a heartbeat as we try to keep the purity by eliminating the evil, cleansing. How did we get into the mess that we're in? That's what Paul is trying to figure out. He's wondering how the law, so good, can be used for hate. He's wondering how the gift of the church, the gift of the church can, well, oh, poor Paul. <laughs> He's seen fights break out in virtually every congregation he started. He's seen this amazing grace, this wonderful grace, this beautiful grace that can be turned into something that you can use against your neighbor, that turns into something that says, I'm not going to accept you. Not even the cross of Jesus Christ can save you. You can take a good word like justice, and you can wield it like a knife. You can take a good word like communion and use it to cover yourself up so that you don't do the right thing, the just thing. You can use communion, the community. We've got to keep ourselves together and be like Pilate, washing his hands. Getting clean, we just can't involve ourselves in the struggle, not at this time. Paul says there's a cosmic power in evil that can take what is good and turn it. Saul was on the side of justice when he held those coats of those who were stoning Stephen. Stephen, they say, had a face like an angel. People can take a cross, a good thing, a salvation, and twist it and turn it into a swastika. Such is the power of sin. Paul knows it. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? It all seems lost. Oh, wretched man that I am. And it is at this moment that Paul returns to worship. 
Did you hear him? After wrestling with, well, I can't do the things that I can do. I wish I could do. I can't do. I can't do. Shooby dooby do. I can't do. He says, oh, I'm in a mess. And he says, thanks be to God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, he's being rescued. The prince of darkness grim, We tremble not for him, his rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. It's worship. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Returning to worship, a few times a day I think I have to field that question. When are we coming back to church? It can't come soon enough, in my mind. I suspect we need the worship of God more than anything else in all creation. It seems to me so much of the world is just frustrated, it's angry, it's violent. Even turning worship into something that divides. When are we returning to worship? When are we returning to worship? Don't you think about returning to worship? I'm just exhausted by the tone. Paul asks, what will separate us from the love of Christ? What do you think? A pandemic? Six feet of separation, being told to wear a mask. What will separate us from the communion of Christ? What do you think? A demonstration? An election? What will keep us from taking the body of Christ and ripping it apart. Nothing. (laughs) Nothing. (laughs) We take his beautiful life and we tear it up over and over and over and over again. This evil takes over us, O wretched ones that we are. Who will rescue us from this body of death? Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. For nothing will keep us from the love of God. Nothing. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor masks, nor hatred, nor Fox News, or CNN, or the conspiracy theory at hand. Not Facebook, not TikTok, not the Chinese, or the swine flu, or whatever comes next in all creation can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God. And that's when worship begins. When you see the love of our Lord and you give it to one another, that's when worship begins. And now let us affirm our faith. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. 
but we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator, ignoring God's commandments. We violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation. Yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. At this time, we would like to thank you for your continued support of the church and invite you to continue giving either by mail or online.
rescue us, who will save us, oh, return to worship. Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Go knowing that the grace, the beautiful grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit are with us all and all God's people said, amen.